Hello everyone, it's Rob here. Listen, it's YouTube. You know what to do. Uh, hit the bell and the thumbs up, right? Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay, here's so here's something I think we can do. Because this uh, this Trudeau tweet among the onion, it's a good way to talk about the... I had meant to talk about this in the last stream, and I kind of got distracted and didn't end up doing it. Um, which is the whole, like, Paris Climate Agreement stuff. Oh, congrats, Arena. And finally do imperialism overseas, apparently. Well done. We were pulling for you. So let's see if I can find the post on this. So a big thing about Joe Biden's, like, administration, and a lot of people, when I was, like, criticizing Biden uh, in the run-up to the election, a lot of people were saying, well, you got to look at Joe Biden's climate plan. He's got this great, great multi-trillion dollar climate plan. You know, that was somewhat uh, suspect, in many ways, because yeah, he talks about believing science, but then like when Republicans are like, but Joe Biden wants to ban fracking, which many scientists agree is not good and actually bad for the environment. And Joe, and they were just like, no, no, we love fracking, Jack. Come on, man. I'll never ban fracking. So they immediately backtracked on that. That's a kind of worrying sign. But day one, when Biden uh, got when he got into office, that was one of the first tweets from like the, the POTUS account. President Biden. I still have a hard time believing that. President Joe Biden. I, I honestly like still pretty shocked that that's where we ended up. But one of the first uh, tweets from him, from the POTUS account, was like, we're rejoining the, the Paris Climate Agreement, Jack, which Trump had infamously withdrawn from, which uh, certainly when we're facing this big climate crisis is definitely a fucked up thing to do. So I had a tweet about this on Friday, and I, I meant to talk about it on Friday, but I got distracted. We, can, we should talk about it now. Because, while I, I guess on a, one level it's it's good that the United States is like getting back into the Paris Climate Agreement, I mean, it just signals that they're like at least acknowledging that it's an issue, rather than just like n doing nothing, or in fact just doubling down on all the worst behaviors that's causing the climate crisis in the first place. So I guess on a certain level, that is helpful to just have them acknowledge that. But as I pointed out in this tweet, I'll find the tweet here. Hold on one sec. So here's the thing that I was trying to point out. Um, while it's good that the United States is back in that agreement, Canada never left the Paris Agreement. We've been in there the whole time. And the, the Paris Agreement is 100% non-binding. So Canada has been in there the entire time. We've been in the Paris Climate Agreement the whole time. and. There is nothing actually like compelling anyone who joins this agreement to do anything to actually meet the targets they're agreeing to. So this is what the, we're agree we're on pace to meet the agreed upon 2030 emissions targets in like 200 years. And here's where I got this info from from this piece in the National Observer. So we're on we're right on pace to meet those Paris climate targets two centuries from now. So let's take a look at this National Observer article. This is from April 25th, 2019. So certain things have changed since there, but uh, I think it's worth pointing this out. So last week, the Canadian government released its annual greenhouse gas report, which now includes data for 2017. The first thing that jumped out at me, and this is written by Barry Saxifridge, was the 12 million ton rise in emissions since last year's report. In practical terms, this means that policymakers need to figure out how to eliminate another 12 million tons to meet Canada's climate targets. And now the country has one less year to pull it off. And now it's multiple less years. To give you a sense of scale, increasing Canada's climate challenge by 13 million tons of CO2 is equivalent to tossing another New Brunswick's worth of emissions onto the already huge pile that needs to be eliminated. What caused such a big one-year jump? Unsurprisingly, it was caused by a surge in the pollution from the oil and gas industry. Wow, that's great. That's shocking. Their Canadian emissions jumped 12 million tons uh, from last year's report. Yep, that equals the entire national increase. So the oil and gas industry added another huge emissions burden and caused another lost year in the national climate fight because that industry refuses to stop increasing its pollution. In response to questions about the latest jump in emissions, Environment and Climate Change Minister Catherine McKenna sent a statement to National Observer saying, Canada's climate plan is working and the overall trend in emissions is downward toward 2030. How can we meet any meaningful target when we keep uh, harvesting oil from the tar sands? It makes no sense. It is complete insanity, James. That's correct. Clean oil. Yeah. 
Isn't Canada one of the most polluting countries per capita? Yes, and we're going to get into this as well, um, because people were talking about hitting a goal in 2050 of net zero emissions. Now, I've talked in the past, I've talked on my podcast to um, Jessica Green about this. I've talked about net zero emissions and what that means. It's basically just meaningless uh, dog shit that, you know, allows us to like move a bunch of numbers around to basically factor in non-existent carbon capture technology that does not exist and is just like, it's basically just magical thinking. Um, and also none of that changes the fact that we have Canadian mining and resource extraction companies all over the world, not just in Canada. So, you know, while we, maybe we might have make some kind of a, a major impact on our actual emissions and the emissions that Canada is putting into the atmosphere, but um, it doesn't really affect anything when we still have, you know, fossil fuel extraction companies and mining companies uh, devastating, you know, countries all over the world and doing the polluting there. It's like, it, oh, the pollution doesn't count if our companies are polluting in, like, uh, Bolivia or, you know, Chile or where, where, wherever. They're, like, there's a huge web of mining, Canadian mining corporations that are just, like, out there doing this shit, um at all times so the whole thing about net zero emissions by by 2050 is complete like it's just complete nonsense yeah now ecologist elon musk is investing in oil drilling in texas that's right that's how much he hates fossil fuels so yeah she said canada's climate plan is working and the overall trend in emissions is downward toward 2030 which is true it is going down it is going down um and here's how much it's going down Let's take a look at the overall trend in emissions towards Canada's 2030 target. As most people know, and this is part of the, the very serious Paris Climate Agreement, countries pledged a 2030 climate target as part of the Global Paris Agreement. The Trudeau government pledged to meet a goal already set by Stephen Harper for a 30% reduction from 2005. So since 2005, we now have 12 years of data at this time when this came out in 2019 covering 2005 to 2017. At this halfway point, emissions have only declined by 2%. Sure, and that is technically, like McKenna says, a downward trend. But as this chart on the right shows, it's so foot-draggingly slow that it will take two centuries for Canada to reach its Paris target at that pace. And it will take nearly a thousand years to reach Canada's 2050 target level. So we're on pace to hit those 2050 targets in the year 2961 and currently where we're headed in terms of like our civil like global civilization is a a global warming of i think 3.5 degrees by the next 100 years by the end of the next century which is basically the end of all human civilization so we're not really doing too well we've we've never left this paris agreement we made the we we made a big show of it trudeau has been able to use that to pad his kind of climate credentials we are nowhere near actually hitting the targets that we've agreed to. Quilo, that's another good point. That's assuming the trend holds, that we can continue even decreasing this. You see, here's our Paris target. This is the trend. If we're able to go down 2% every 12 years, we're going to hit that 2030 target in 200 years from now. So 1,000 years might sound shocking, and it, it does sound shocking, yes, but actually I've been lowballing the problem. If you look more closely at the emissions data, we would never reach Canada's climate targets. Why? Because the oil and gas industry has its own overall trend when it comes to emitting climate pollution. And its, its emissions trend has been rapidly and relentlessly upwards for as long as Canada has been keeping records. For example, since 2005, the industry's climate pollution in Canada has been rising an average of 2% per year. So I've added oil and gas industry emissions to my chart as an orange line. As you can see, the oil and gas industry already pollutes 50 million tons more than the entire country's 2050 climate target. So here's our trend. Uh, here's our 2% downward trend. And here's the trend of the oil and gas industry uh, pollution. Okay, and I'm just understanding this chart here. So here's the 2030 emissions target. This is where we're supposed to be here at 2030. It's but The line's supposed to be going like this. It's going like this, extending 200 years into the future. And meanwhile, we have the oil and gas industry rising uh, steadily throughout that time. 
But Rob, this article was written just under two years ago. I'm sure things have changed now that we got the, rid of the bad orange man here. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Is like there's been this big kind of celebration. America's back in the in the Paris Climate Agreements, baby. Kind of everyone's kind of dusting off their hands. Like we did it. We did it, folks. We got back in the Paris Climate Agreement. As we're seeing, using Canada as, as an example is really illustrative because we never left that agreement. We have we've had a prime minister in place since 2015 that believes the science, which is apparently a big thing that we need to uh, we all we need to do. We need to listen to the scientists. Well, we have a prime minister that's doing that. He talks a lot about the environment and how we we're, we're not doing enough. We need to do better. We're still in that Paris Agreement. We didn't have we a bad orange man. Use the computer uh, to mark up the uh, size of the account. Thank you for the hundred bits. Anonymous cheer. Very kind of you. So America's back in that Paris Climate Agreement. But as we're seeing here, like, what does that actually mean? Well, it means fucking nothing. It means nothing at all. Uh, it's literally just purely an aesthetic thing that's designed to kind of make us feel like something good is happening. Um, so that's what the Paris Climate Agreement means, which is nothing at all. Here's the oil and gas industry versus the provinces. To further illustrate the overwhelming impact of this industry's surging pollution in Canada, I created the chart below using the newest data. It compares oil and gas industry emissions, orange line, to those from entire provinces in the blue. Back in 2005, Ontario emitted almost 50 million tons more than the oil and gas industry did. Since then, Ontario cut emissions 22%, mostly by closing its coal plants. Rapidly cutting emissions is exactly what the science says everyone must do to avoid a full-blown climate crisis. In contrast, the oil and gas industry jacked up their climate pollution in Canada by 23%. That huge surge in emissions drove this one industry's pollution past the provincial totals from Quebec, British Columbia, Manitoba, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland and Labrador combined. It's an understatement to say that the oil and gas industry's climate pollution is out of control in Canada. This is what we're told, right? We can't, well, we have to have this slow transition. We can't just like, well, you think we can just like cut off fossil fuels now? It's going to destroy our whole economy. It's going to destroy our whole, our whole way of life. But like, with the, the further along we get here, the more necessary it's going to be to make these kind of drastic changes. Like, I think the quote that I read about the Paris Climate Agreement that really stuck out to me was like, this would have been a great first step in like 1980. Like the fact that we're still doing this in 2021, when we're really kind of getting down to the wire with this shit, is inexcusable. And the idea, like people talk about 2030, like it's some far off, distant, distant date in the future. This is nine years from now. This is like coming up very shortly. Yeah, and out on having kids, they'd be the last generation duking it out with the Zoomers for dwindling resources. Yeah, and you know, I do have kids. Like my son's five years old. And anytime I think about these stories, I'm thinking about him, right? I would ideally not like him to like be my age in like Mad Max world, right? 30 years from now. Uh, it's fucking scary. I mean, he could become a warlord. He is very like strong-willed, let's say. I guess that could be it. He could become like the Immortan Joe. Yeah, this is barely even a political issue in the US election. It wouldn't even have come up in the Democratic debates. It instantly hadn't pushed it. And again, the big win that Biden is talking about is getting back in the Paris agreements, which is meaningless. This is what we're getting at. It's fucking meaningless. I'll finish up with a quick walk down memory lane, looking at Canada's long history of climate promises and the emissions trends that emerged after each of them. Oh, this is this is really this is really instructive, this stuff. And I had another someone actually in the replies to this. Let's see if I can find it. We're going to get to the end of the article here. But like this is the this is CO2 in our in our atmosphere from 1960 to where we are now, 2020. And here's all the Here's all the climate agreements we've made along the way. All these little dots here are all the different climate change accords that we've made. Here's Kyoto, the Rio summit, Kyoto, the Copenhagen accords. There's the Paris agreement. You notice a little trend here though? While we're making all these fucking bullshit agreements, jerking each other off over like our wonderful enlightened leadership, doing something about this issue, the fundamental problem of CO2 being pumped into our atmosphere and warming the planet is not being addressed in any way. 
Yeah, talk about the, the Cope, the Copenhagen Accords. So this is what this paragraph is about, I think. I'll finish out, okay, uh, our fir the first stop is more than 30 years ago. It was 1988. Ronald Reagan was the US president. The Soviet Union was still a thing. That's a little bit of a pang of nostalgia with that. Calgary hosted the Winter Olympics. That year, Prime Minister Mulroney set Canada's first climate target. The target required an average cut of 1% per year. So how much climate pollution did Canada end up cutting? As my next chart shows, Canada's emissions have risen by 116 million tons. So there's the Mulroney's pledge in 1989, 1988, and that's where we are now. Then 20 years ago, the Chrétien, the Chrétien government promised that Canada would cut climate pollution under the 1997 Kyoto Accord. Once again, that target required an average cut of 1% per year. And once again, Canada increased its emissions instead. 10 years ago, the Harper government promised that Canada would cut climate pollution by, yep, an average of 1% per year under the 2009 Copenhagen Accord. That same year, the government also made a longer term pledge, an average of 2% per year through 2050, Canadian emissions kept growing. And here's a friendly reminder that the country's Copenhagen pledge comes due next year. If you're wondering how close Canada is to meeting it, the new greenhouse gas report says we are polluting 110 million tons more than promised. Finally, in 2016, the Trudeau government promised an average cut of 2% per year under the Paris Agreement. As we saw at the top of the article, emissions have gone up. It seems evident that there is no solution to the climate crisis under capitalism. I mean, Red Scary, I would agree with that. That seems to be kind of the fundamental issue at, at stake here, doesn't it? And meanwhile, we have all these fucking posts from like Shell and Exxon being like, oh, we're all in this together. Here's what you can do uh, in your own personal life to play your part. You can like compost or we can recycle. And when we recycle, we take all our plastic stuff and all our stuff that's like recyclable and we put it on a boat, a ship, and we send the ship to China, where China then burns it. That's our recycle. So that's what that's what you can do. You just recycle all those bottles and cans and stuff. We're continually making this issue worse while making promises every couple of years that it's going to get better. It's not getting better. We're offloading any responsibility for this onto people's like individual consumer choices. And this is like, this is neoliberalism too, right? It's like they can't address this issue by, by changing capitalism at all or challenging that in any way. Uh, they've got to work within the market. So that's why, they're, that's why they're obsessed with carbon taxes. You know, if we just get these carbon taxes, this is like a conservative approach to climate policy because it's working within the market. So we're doing carbon taxes and we're, we're doing a personal responsibility. We're gonna do personal responsibility and everyone's gonna make greener choices we're going to get electric cars. We're going to get Elon Musk to uh, make a bunch of electric cars, and that's going to solve the problem. And this is why like, we, we only have market-based solutions to this, and the market is the fucking problem. It's PR, as Montreal Munchies is pointing out. It's a way to signal that we're taking this problem seriously, but as this article has like, repeatedly pointed out, we're not taking it seriously. The Rachel Notley solution. What a fucking missed opportunity that was, wasn't it, Grammar Socialist? What a gigantic, goddamn missed opportunity that Ra Rachel Notley government was. She brought in a deeply unpopular carbon tax just to oversee this rise in emissions, but as you'll recall, by like not being too mean to the oil companies, then that allowed them to like maintain power, right? Because they weren't because then conservatives weren't able to frame them as being like eco-communists who hated the oil industry and hated oil sands workers. So they were able to kind of like outthink them on that. And that's, uh, that's how they were able to like um, maintain their grip on power and allow to like pass these kind of like moderate reforms that they were going for. So that was kind of a 4D chess by Notley. And, uh, well, sorry, they actually got immediately hosed by conservatives who frame, who did in fact frame them as being eco-communist, uh, who hate uh, oil sands workers and they whatever meager reforms they were able to make were immediately wiped out by the jason kenny government so it's almost sometimes i get the feeling that that approach doesn't really work that approach of like trying to like find a third position between doing a just transition and and transitioning away from fossil fuels entirely or just doubling down on all our fossil fuel uh usage sometimes i feel like there's not a third position that you can occupy 
at what point is it acceptable to just start crippling the ability of oil companies to function? I mean, that's that's an interesting question, um, Quilio. At what point is it acceptable to just start crippling the ability of oil companies to function? I mean, I don't have the answer to that question, but it's something that's interest. It's very interesting that we should all be thinking about. Because according to this piece that I'm looking at here, and looking at some of the data, one argument, and I'm not, I'm personally, I'm not going to make this argument. One argument would be that like that time was like decades ago. I just believe in, 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 in I, what I personally believe is finding like sensible solutions and compromise and building a coalition to get people to, you know, come on board with a, a, a climate focused agenda. That's what I personally believe. I'm sure there are people out there that would make that argument that like, the time to just start like, you know, going after oil company infrastructure was literally decades ago. That's not something that I happen to believe personally. And that's one of the that's one of the freaky things about this current moment and going after like right wing extremists and stuff and domestic terrorism. And listen, there's a there's a very serious threat of right wing extremism, and I don't think that should just be left unchecked. I mean, it seems undeniable that Eventually, the people in power are not going to be making a huge distinction between people that are like bombing infrastructure to, to purge communists to start some kind of race war and people that are like occupying private property owned by resource extraction companies, indigenous protests like Standing Rock, like the Wet'suwet'en blockades, people that start going after pipeline infrastructure or, or oil company infrastructure or executives. Which is again not something that I would ever advocate for, but if people did start doing that, they're they're going to be treated just as harshly probably by the state as these kind of right wing extremists, if not even not worse, like if not more harshly, because I'm sure a lot of these ruling class people they do see the writing on the wall, and they know how desperate people are going to start to get, and when people get desperate, they they get into all kinds of uh, all kinds of they get all kinds of crazy ideas uh, and that's why they're all building like climate bunkers now because they know what the end result to that is and that's why they're starting to pass all these laws about like what constitutes domestic terrorism and and, and often you see that that uh, includes like occupying and destroying uh, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure and things like that radical environmental extremists we're gonna be hearing a lot about that over the course of the next decade and beyond Emissions in 2020 decreased worldwide only due to lockdown and only by 7%. Yeah, that's right. And they still, even with this deadly pandemic, they're still so reluctant to have people stay at home. They, they, they're still getting people to go to work during this deadly pandemic because they can't deal with like the impact that it has on the market. It's going to be the same thing. It's going to be the same thing with the coming climate crisis, which is that the closer we get to this, the solution is going to become clearer but they're not going to be willing to do it because of the effect that that's going to have on the market. To say nothing of what, like, you know, the destruction of our whole civilization is going to have on the, the market. That's, these people only think they're capitalists and they only think quarter to quarter, right? The media always treats left-wing extremists like this much worse, too, with conservatives. It's like, yeah, let's, let's do a deep dive into this white nationalist psyche. They never do it with environmentalists, for example, because to delve into the issue would reveal the liberal hypocrisy on it. The failure to deal with COVID shows that the climate crisis will end humanity. That's... That's kind of one of the things that's a little bit depressing because at the start of at the start of the whole pandemic, I mean, I was seeing some encouraging signs that I was like, oh shit, people like when they when they're confronted with this big crisis, that's like threatening all our well beings. People do kind of like people do have the ability to come together, and it turns out we do have the ability to just like completely change our our whole economy overnight. And so maybe there's maybe that's a sign that getting closer to this climate crisis, that's something that we can do and that we can really just like totally change the way we do things. But then as it gradually kind of crept back, we saw the shock to the market and we saw how unacceptable that was to the people kind of pulling the strings of capital. And we saw it turn, get turned into this like culture war issue, like wearing masks and or just the, the pandemic existing in the first place in a sort of similar way that the climate crisis has been turned into a culture war issue. I started to lose some of the encouragement that I've been feeling about that. It's great to have a, a United States president that believes the science. When we're talking about half measures versus no measures at all, ultimately, this is the exact same result that we're heading towards. 
I'm an essential worker for Rogers, and when the lockdown began again, they gave a note saying we're an essential part of upkeeping the Rogers network. When in reality, all I do is deliver people new iPhones. Yeah, well, you don't want to... 1-800-NATS, you don't want to let down the Rogers family like that. The Rogers family is relying on you to, to keep delivering uh, shareholder profits. Because that's the most important thing. That is the most important thing that we always need to focus on. All right, that's the end of the video, everyone. Thank you for watching it. If you haven't already, hit the, hit the thumbs up, hit the bell, leave a comment or whatever, or don't. And I'll talk to you soon, okay? All right, bye.